Let's set the record straight. I'm an American. I don't know anything. I enjoy blaring air conditioning. I swear by Fahrenheit over Celsius, except I will admit that the metric system is better. I think all washers and dryers should be enormous. I enjoy indulging in Cheez-Its. But do you know what I enjoy more? Getting the hell out of here from time to time. So last year, around this time, I did exactly that. I pulled the classic, ooh, I just graduated college and so I have this awkwardly small gap of time that I don't know what to do with, but it represents my only piece of freedom before I start working for the rest of my life. Let's go to Europe. Of course, me being who I am, I booked the flight and then proceeded to do none of the actual planning until a few weeks before. And through my procrastination research, I discovered a recurring theme and that is that I was a day late actually several days late and a dollar short actually several dollars short yeah so I just decided to wing it and I'm gonna tell you about what I learned so that you don't repeat the same mistakes that I did and you do repeat some of the few things that I actually did right as a huge disclaimer this is not the professional's guide to visiting Europe. This is not even the amateur's guide. This is the idiot's guide. I'm sure that so many people out there are better at planning than I am, but if you're like me and you procrastinated, you're welcome. I'm not claiming to know everything about Europe. I mean, God forbid I'm an American, okay? I mean, I was able to visit six different countries over the course of a month and spend right around $3,000 and I was only discriminated against like twice. So I would consider that a win. Some very important context. Where the hell did I even go? I visited six countries and stayed in eight different cities over the span of a month, specifically May 16th to June 15th of last year meaning that I averaged around three days in every city and spent the rest of my time traveling. I flew from the US directly to Amsterdam and then made a loop around Europe. So I started in Amsterdam, then went to Munich, then Innsbruck, Florence, Rome, Nice, Madrid, Paris, and back to Amsterdam, and then back to the US of A. My main travel companion was my bestie Chrissy, who was with me the entirety of the trip, but we also met up with various people along the way. Chrissy and I used three main factors to select which eight cities we would go to, interest, cost, and how satisfying of a loop the destination made. I'm only partially kidding. First and foremost, you have to consider interest in the destination. I will say, try to be an open book. You're not really going to know until you're there, but you do need to pick a few core places to at least start basing your loop off of. And for me, that was Munich, Innsbruck, and Amsterdam, while Chrissy was particularly interested in Madrid, Paris, and Italy. Just like any piece of Italy. Once we had our core six that we thought we wanted to go to, we were then looking at the cost. And although we didn't flat out eliminate any places because of cost, I think it's really important that if you are traveling with other people to level set financially before you go. Chrissy and I didn't make a full on budget before we went, but we did set some expectations financially just about how much we each wanted to spend overall, how much we are comfortable spending on housing versus transportation versus activities. And having those conversations is really important so that you don't want to rip each other's throats out by the end of the trip. And the last thing to consider is how satisfying of a loop the destinations you picked make. Just hear me out. Living in the US means a flight over to Europe is expensive, so you want to hit as many places as you can but you're also time constrained. We had a month, which seems like a lot, but it goes by very quickly. So you wanna balance seeing what you wanna see with also spending your time in those places as opposed to just physically traveling from place to place. This meant we really had to narrow our focus on the core destinations and build our route and loop based off of those. It's kind of a tragic process, just like cut off. Cut off! 
prior to this trip, I had never packed for a month before and it definitely showed. Like I was really that bitch who would show up to the airport with an overstuffed carry-on that was questionably too large and didn't fit the requirements. So I'd have to sneak it past the flight attendants and I would only be going for like three days. And I didn't particularly want to wheel multiple giant suitcases across Europe. So I gave in and I became a backpack girly. Kind of proud of it. I mean, I fit everything I needed for a month in this bag. I have never felt more powerful than when I was strutting across Europe with this bag on my back. Like, hello? I looked like a hermit crab, but I felt amazing. This is the Osprey, Osprey, I don't know. But seriously, this thing is an absolute tank. Like I fit everything that I needed in here and more. And it was very comfortable to carry around. It has a waist strap right here so that whenever you're making your longer journeys to the airport or train station or what have you, it didn't feel that heavy and trust me i had a lot of shit in here and i know this bag is a little bit on the pricier side so don't feel like you need this one specifically but the real selling point i think for me was okay i'm a little out of practice are you seeing this right now like shut up it's backpack inception yeah yeah it's the perfect size. I mean, I'm 5'4", and I'm weak as hell, and I could pretty comfortably lift this thing with one hand, carry it around, put the waist strap on. I was ready to go, baby. And because of the detachable backpack, I only had to lug this big thing around when we were actually traveling from place to place. Every other day, I would leave the bigger part locked up in the hostel, and then I would only take the smaller backpack with just what we needed for the day. I will say, although she is rather spacious, you're still going to want some organization in your bag because otherwise it can become a black hole. And that is why the number one thing that I recommend, it is absolutely topping the charts of essentials, is packing cubes. Let me just put you on this shit. I owe whoever designed this my entire life because I would not have been able to fit half of the shit that I did without these beauties. I just got a pack of six with assorted sizes off of Amazon for $20. Goat. I used one of the large packing cubes for eight of my cute shirts slash tank tops, two comfy shirts that I could also sleep in, two athletic tanks, an athletic long sleeve, and a flowy button-up shirt that I used as like a shawl or like a cover-up. You know what I mean? In the two medium-sized cubes, I had two pairs of pants, one pair of leggings, one skirt, two dresses, a pair of biker shorts, PJ shorts, my thin rain jacket, and a singular sweatshirt. Yes, it was a true tragedy that I had to select just one sweatshirt from my collection of like five billion, but alas, I survived. And then I used the two skinny long Bella Hadid packing cubes for toiletries slash hostel essentials and then underwear and stuff. Yeah. I'll talk about my hostel essentials more in the lodging section of this video, but I will add in one comment, just one comment on my toiletries. Do not fucking buy this soap. Long story short, Dr. Bronner and I have beef. Chrissy and I tried using it for like the first two places to wash our hair as shampoo and conditioner and body wash and regular soap. Don't do that. The last packing cube was another one of the large ones and I actually did something smart with it rare Sydney W and I used it as like a laundry hamper so anytime I would wear clothes and they would get dirty from my main packing cubes I would just move them over into this one so that it was still condensed and within a cube but it wasn't touching all my other stuff because that's icky in the smaller backpack that we took around everywhere this is what we brought with us one comment on that bring whatever medication you need 
But please also bring Pepto-Bismol and Miralax, okay? Just speaking from experience. Other items that I packed were two pairs of shoes. I was originally going to pack more, but shoes just take up a lot of space, so I would definitely consolidate if you can. I brought my white foam Burks that doubled as shower, pool, beach shoes, and also just shoes that were generally comfortable enough to wear around for an extended period of time and then my other pair of shoes were my comfortable sneakers. Chrissy brought Converse and she wore them on the first couple of days that we were there, got insane blisters and then for the entire rest of the trip had to like bandage up her foot every time we left. So just get the comfy sneakers. I don't care if they're ugly. I brought little soap leaves for laundry, which is basically just detergent that isn't liquid. And I would say you don't really need this if you're staying in hostels. Most of them had like detergent vending machines, but if you're using Airbnbs, you're probably going to want that. And then of course, I brought all of the documents I needed. So my passport with a printed out photocopy of it in a different place, just in case it got stolen, even though that thing was strapped on me at all times. So it really was impossible for it to get stolen unless I also got stolen. My vaccine card and then just like a print printed list almost like an itinerary of all of the different places we were staying at with our reservation confirmation the address of the place the dates we were there and just like a map of that area so in case we got lost or our phones weren't working or something we would not die i actually feel like i did a good job packing we did laundry two or three times throughout the trip and i never had a time where i was like oh shit, i want to wear that but it's dirty this green dress and i went through everything together like homegirl was run through by the end of the trip so i would recommend if it is your style get a couple of dresses or like one piece clothing items that are thin breathable flexible because that's what she was and i only wanted to wear her at all times and also remember to save yourself a little bit of space if you want to buy souvenirs if you see cute clothing items while you're there you don't want to pack yourself 100% to the brim because it's annoying to repack every single time you move places and you won't have any space to put anything. Traveling from place to place was definitely one of the things that I was most stressed about going in, especially because in the U.S. we hate our citizens and we don't have a widespread passenger railway system, so I didn't have a lot of experience. But honestly, the railway is slayed. Like, using rail transportation as our main form of transportation was inexpensive, it was pretty easy, and after the first one or two times doing it, we felt good about it. Going from Amsterdam to Munich to Innsbruck, Florence, Rome, and Nice, we strictly used rail transportation. And we did this by getting the Eurail Global Pass. Chrissy and I each bought the $288 seven day pass, meaning that for seven days we could travel on an unlimited number of trains within a 24 hour period. I thought the system was relatively convenient. It had decent flexibility. Like if one of your trains got canceled or you missed it, you could just book another train at a later time within that day. The only thing you have to get over is just having a panic attack about seat reservations. No one told us about that. We were using the Eurail Rail Planner app to actually book all of the train times we had and you can filter through, you can see how long you would have to transfer trains, how many times you'd have to transfer, how long all the train rides were. It was great except it conveniently left out the fact that you need to book seat reservations and it doesn't have that functionality within the app. What we learned the hard way is whenever you're picking destinations and train times within the app and it gives you a QR code, that's like your ticket. 
That is how you get into the train station, past the gates. It's how you get on the train, but it doesn't give you a seat. And the seat reservation piece is actually very important because a lot of countries require it. And even if they don't, you will want a seat reservation or you'll end up being shuffled between like 600 seats as everyone tells you to get out of their way. And then the only place left is to sit on the ground between the two train cars next to the bathroom, which ends up being somewhat convenient because you have raging traveler's diarrhea. Yeah. So to resolve this predicament, number one, bring Pepto-Bismol with you, I swear to God. And number two, every time you arrive to a new place, book your seat reservation for the next place you're going to at the ticket encounter. All you have to do is go to the ticket encounter or information desk, show them your Eurail pass, show them the trains you intend on taking in a couple of days, and they should be able to find you a seat and book it for you right then. It does cost money, which kind of sucks. Trains are great otherwise, and I promise that your first time getting a seat reservation might be a little rough, but as long as you're getting them a few days before you leave and you show them their year rail and you show them that you are from another country and have no idea what you're doing, they will probably be helpful. We did strategically book two flights, one from Nice to Madrid and the other from Madrid to Paris. And that was because the time travel it would take on a train was just way more time than we wanted to spend. It's all personal preference. If you want to stay on the cheaper side of things, definitely leverage rail, but from time to time, a flight might make more sense. We also did take one bus and this was purely out of necessity because although I just explained that you need to get your seat reservations a few days before, I didn't listen to my own advice and they were all sold out. So instead of being trapped in Paris, we rubbed our two brain cells together and discovered that Flixbus is basically like the Megabus or Greyhound equivalent of Europe. They might also have Greyhounds and Megabuses there, I have no idea, but Flixbus was the move because it was cheap. We got our tickets like the day before and we made it. While we were within the city, we mostly just walked to get around or use the metro or inner city railway system. It worked pretty well, no problems. We did use Uber like twice and I would say do what you got to do, but each Uber ride was like 50 or $60 versus $3 on the train or $0 on foot, so use it sparingly. The biggest debate when it comes to lodging in Europe is hostel, hotel, Airbnb. And I can definitively say that I am a hostel Airbnb girly. We stayed in hostels for both times we were in Amsterdam, in Munich, in Innsbruck, in Florence, in Rome, and in Nice, and I only hated one of the places. Hostels are cheap. Like we were averaging only 25 to $30 per night at the ones we stayed at. Plus you can meet awesome people in hostels from all different parts of the world. So it's kind of the best time to learn from other people, meet new people. We met a bestie from Australia that we hung out with for a few days. And I can definitely say that meeting people in hostels was one of the highlights of my trip. The biggest downside to staying in a hostel is you are more than likely sleeping with with strangers, which can be scary. Airbnbs are a little bit more expensive, but usually it's just you staying in the room or you and your group. So you kind of know what to expect. You see the pictures, you read the reviews, and it's backed by a company that's more easy to go after if things aren't what you expected. Airbnbs are also a great option if you're staying in a larger group. Whenever we were in Madrid, we got an Airbnb and split it between the five of us that were there, and it really was not expensive at all. But of course, if you're staying in multiple Airbnbs, and not maxing out the capacity of the Airbnb, it's gonna get a little bit pricier. And then the third option is a typical hotel. I would say this is probably the most expensive option and I don't have much more to say other than that because I didn't spend the money to stay in any of them. If you are gonna go the hostel route, I have three main pieces of advice for you. Number one, if you're a female, stay in the female-only dorms because men are gross. 
We only stayed in one mixed dorm and it was by far the worst experience we had in all of the hostels. People were canoodling. There was a guy staying on the bunk below me instead of Chrissy and just... No. Secondly, leverage a private room in a hostel from time to time. We had stayed in eight beds, six beds, all over the place. And by the time we got to Rome, I figured we would just need a little bit of a break. So we decided to do a two bed private room in the hostel with just Chrissy and I. And it was just a healing experience, honestly. My last piece of advice for the hostels is come prepared. Bring an eye mask and earplug so that no matter what, you can actually sleep at night. Bring a really long charging cord and a power adapter that has multiple plugs in it so that if there aren't a lot of outlets, you still have access to your phone and all of that other shit you need. Bring shower shoes, a lock so that whenever you're out and about for the day or sleeping at night, if you don't feel comfortable leaving your stuff out, out, you can put it in one of the hostel lockers and lock it up for safekeeping. Honestly though, to reiterate, I felt perfectly safe, perfectly comfortable, and kind of had the time of my life in all of the hostels I stayed at, except for the one with the men. If you're visiting any of the same cities as me, here is my quick review of each of the hostels that I stayed at. All right, now for the fun part. If you happen to be visiting any of the same cities that I did, consider this Sydney's must-see slash do list, but take it with a grain of salt because I am not a professional and was only in these places for like three days, but I tried to maximize the time I had. Amsterdam and Frank House. You just have to see it. It's a really important part of history, and it was one of the top things that I wanted to do while in Europe. It also made me cry, so I guess that's a selling point. I will say that because of the size of the place, tickets are limited, so you actually do need to buy tickets like a month in advance, and of course, I didn't do that. So luckily enough, Amsterdam was the one place we went to twice, so when I was there the first time, I bought tickets for the second time that we would be there. Take a boat tour, okay? Amsterdam is known for its canals, its waterways, and the tour guides are hilarious, plus there's almost always alcohol on those, and who doesn't love being drunk on a boat? Also go to the Erotic Museum. I know it's kind of a weird thing to do, and it's in the Red Light District, which is historically kind of a sketchy place to be, but honestly, go to the Erotic Museum. It was hilarious, and I loved it. Yep. In Munich, we booked a day trip actually to Bavaria to see the Neuschwanstein Castle. And the tour we booked through TripAdvisor also happened to have a stop at the Schloss Linderhof, which I knew nothing about. It just literally happened to be on the tour that we were on. And oh my God, you need to see this place. Definitely see both if you can. The exterior of the Neuschwanstein is incredible and the location is amazing. The Linderhof is amazing. And the story of King Ludwig is... He's just my role model, and if you know, you know. Munich also has some beautiful sunsets, so we actually climbed up this bridge to get the best view, and it was gorgeous. Also, we didn't fall off, so that was a plus. Innsbruck ended up being my favorite place that we went to, and I could envision myself living there, but unfortunately, I live here. But if you are going, I would say just soak up the vibes. I mean, the buildings are incredible. All of the people were super friendly. Food was awesome, and and the incline, you got to do it. In Florence, there's a lot of places that people recommend, but I would say one that does not get talked about enough is the Baboli Gardens. They're super vast gardens that you can walk through. We spent multiple hours in there just getting lost and exploring all of the areas. We also did a classic Tuscan bus wine tour, and although I hate wine, it was pretty fun. 
all the people were hilarious. You get to try a bunch of different wines and olive oils. And I would chug my glass every time because I don't like the taste of wine. And then an Italian would clap me on the back and it was great. Rome has a lot of historic attractions and I had actually been to Rome before. So I had seen them, but it was Chrissy's first time. And if you've never been to the Vatican or the Colosseum, I feel like you just have to go. In Nice, it's Southern France. So go to the beach. Although fair warning, the rocks get hot as hell. Nice is also very conveniently located. It's right next to Monaco. So we took a day trip there and saw these beautiful rose gardens. And also it's very close to Ez, which is this very quaint medieval village that I knew almost nothing about, but it is literally the prettiest place on earth. It's on top of the mountain, which is beautiful, but we didn't know there was a bus that went to the top of the mountain, so we walked up the side. I was in Birkenstocks and a white skirt. I've never sweat more in my life. In Madrid, definitely take the time to get a tour inside the Royal Palace. If you have a little bit extra time, I would recommend a day trip to Toledo, which is what we did. And again, gorgeous. Why does the US not look like this? And lastly, my must-sees for Paris are a little basic but just hear me out. Eiffel Tower at night when it sparkles, duh. Palace of Versailles, but specifically if you can go in the summer on a Saturday, they have fountain and firework shows. Arc de Triomphe if you want a good view of the city, and Saint Chapelle has the prettiest stained glass windows ever. Although it's a pretty quick trip, you mostly just walk to the top of the stairs and look at the beautiful inside. It's definitely worth it. Also, sorry to be a hater, but the Louvre really wasn't all that and the Mona Lisa was not giving. She's way too small. My three biggest pieces of advice for when you're planning what activities you want to do or what excursions you want to go on is to know yourself. After many, many, many museums, I'm going to be honest, I was kind of sick of them. I know that makes me uncultured and a terrible person, but... I had just seen too many museums at that point. Like how many times do I need to see a painting of a woman squirting breast milk into a man's mouth? The answer should be zero, but it was like 30. The museums are oftentimes massive and in abundance. So if you have the time and you want to carve out the time, do so. But if you're like me, you might need a little museum speed run every now and then. If you're a student, bring your student ID. I had actually just graduated, so I did kind of lie to all of Europe, but that's besides the point. It gets you into museums way cheaper than if you're just a regular touristy person. Utilize Rick Steves, okay? Rick Steves is like the Bob Ross of tourism. I'm obsessed with that man. He has his own app and he gives cute little audio and walking tours for a ton of the destinations that you're probably going to and it's free. You could say that frolicking around Europe having the best time of my life for a month with all of my best friends was priceless or you could say that it was $3,005.11. Both would be accurate. I know everyone's budget and financial situation is going to be different and it definitely can change some of the expectations of what you're able to do in Europe, but I genuinely felt that I was able to accomplish everything that I wanted and more and I spent about $100 a day to do it. You can stop clapping now. For full transparency, the $3,005 total does not include my flight over to Europe, but that's because the flight over can vary based on where you live and how far out you're looking for tickets, whereas the rest is stuff that I feel that you can actually control. If you are curious though, I flew from the Dulles airport to Amsterdam and then round trip back and my ticket was $847.87. But breaking down the $3,000 total of what I spent while I was actually there, this is what it looked like. 
Around 32% of my overall spending was on lodging, meaning in simple terms, I averaged about $32 a night staying in either a hostel or an Airbnb. Our food expenditures accounted for around a quarter of our overall spending, and I will say that you will probably see a lot of variance in this number depending on what your habits are. Chrissy and I would split a lot of meals and get breakfast on the go just because that's what we needed and because we didn't have anywhere to put leftover food. So we figured the best strategy was get something small or split something. And then if we were still hungry, get more. If you plan to spend a lot on drinks or going to bars or clubs, this can very quickly. We definitely drank and went out a couple of times, but I would say that overall we did not go crazy and that's the reason why we were able to keep this relatively low. About a third of the transportation spending was on the Eurail Global Pass alone, but then when you factor in the seat reservation fees and any sort of random other little train trips we took, I would say probably half of our transportation spending was on rail and the other half was on either those two flights we took or the two random Ubers that we took. Which when you think about it, it really goes to show just how much more inexpensive rail actually is because we only took two flights that were relatively short and took two Ubers that were like 20 minutes long each versus rail we went all over the place on that thing. On average, we only spent around $19 on activities per day, which is very good. This definitely fluctuated by day. Some days where we took full day tours on a bus or had a lot of excursions, it could be over $100. And other days we were spending maybe a couple of euros just to go to a museum, chill at the beach, or go to a park. The final 1% of my spending came from miscellaneous stuff, so doing laundry, buying souvenirs, that type of thing. Because I knew space in my bag would be limited and I didn't want to spend a ton of money on souvenirs, I actually just bought a postcard for like one or two euros at each of the cities I went to and then... I had my brother make me this collage because he's artistic and I'm not. In my opinion, it's a really cool way to commemorate the trip and it was almost free because I didn't pay my brother anything. So thanks, buddy. Like I said earlier, we didn't go into the trip with a restrictive budget and we were fairly flexible while still living within our financial means. So it's definitely possible. And if you take more time planning, I guarantee that you can do this even cheaper than how I did it but I am still pretty grateful to say that I got to do everything that I wanted without going broke, so you can too. I'm actually sweating so bad and I'm exhausted because I've been talking for hours and our AC is actually broken, so it feels like I'm back in Europe, Jesus. But genuinely, I hope this was helpful. I know I just spoke a lot and I have very little credibility to speak on, but I did go to Europe, had a great time, and survived. So use my techniques or don't. Love you. Bye. <laughs>